Okay, welcome to our talk on record serialization. In the next 30 minutes or so, we want to share what we call a happy tale with you. And that is how records, a new feature in the JDK, can be leveraged in serialization. To answer this question, we break it down into three parts. First, we look at the concept of serialization, and then we focus on Java serialization, which is Java's serialization framework. Then we move to records. We look at why they were added to the JDK and what they bring to the platform. And then we bring those two bits together and explore the advantages that records have in the context of serialization. And when I say we, I mean uh, Chris and myself. My name is Julia Bös. I work on the OpenJDK as part of the Java platform group at Oracle. I joined in 2019 and have been working on record serialization for the last few months. Hi, I'm Chris Hegarty. I work in the Java platform group at Oracle. I've been working on Java platforms since I joined Sun Microsystems back in the year 2000. I work in the area of networking, core libraries, and serialization. Uh, Julia and I work in the same team, uh, but these days, clearly, we're working from our own homes. OK, and before we dive in, have a quick look at the safe harbor statement. Um, although records are final now in Java 16, we still keep it in here as a formality. OK, let's start with the first part. So to understand the concept of serialization, we have a little diagram here. On, on the left-hand side, you can see a JVM with a foo object. And on the right-hand side, you see a file system that could also just be another JVM connected over the network. Now, when we talk of serialization or serializing, we mean extracting an object state and translating it to a persistent format. Then deserializing or deserialization, on the other hand, is reconstructing an object with equivalent state from that same format. When we say format, in this presentation, we use the word serialized form, and most often that's a serial byte stream. Now, the concept of serialization is very powerful, and many frameworks have implemented it, and one of them is Java serialization. So with Java serialization, to be able to serialize an object, its class has to implement serializable, as you can see here. This is just a marker interface. It doesn't have any behavior or state. And with this, this little foo class is now serializable. This kind of seems too easy. And in fact, the flaws of Java serialization are well known and many. Uh, Brian Gatz gives a good overview in the article that is linked here below. Um, and I want to highlight three points that are especially relevant for the purpose of this talk. So the first one is that Java serialization is really an extra linguistic feature. It comes across like a library feature because you can implement an interface. But under the hood, it uses privileged mechanisms, in particular reflection. It ignores accessibility, most prominently of private fields, and it bypasses constructors. So there's a lot of dark magic going on that is hidden to the developer. There's also not a lot of compiler support. With this foo class, for example, if there was a field of a type that was not serializable, you wouldn't get um, a compiler warning, but instead a runtime error. And then the last point is the so-called magic methods. So yes, you can customize the serialization process by using read object or write object, but those methods are quite hard to find. They don't belong to a public type, and they're also easy to get wrong, for example, if you don't specify the right access modifier. So overall, you can either depend on the framework to do everything for you, which means that you're relying on a lot of opaque mechanisms, or you can implement it yourself, which is quite error prone and not straightforward. So to kind of conflate this, the problem of Java serialization is really that it's not designed as part of the object model. There is no explicit formalized way of extracting object state and reconstructing an object that is properly baked into the object model. And that's so much so that it's actually possible to create impossible objects. That's um, a term coined by Joshua Bloch in Effective Java. Let us explore with an example what this actually means. So here we have this example statue class. Um, it has three private final fields, a string name, an int height, and the location. 
location is a small helper class with, again, two strings for city and country. Both these classes implement serializable, as you can see. They both have uh, constructors with invariant checking. So here we don't want the objects to be null and we don't want the height to be equal to or smaller than zero. Um, for the purpose of this talk, the boilerplate is omitted, as you can see, and we don't have any setters because the state should be final. So with this, we create a statue object that represents the Statue of Liberty. So we have a height of 46 meters and location in New York. So now the choice of this example might seem peculiar to you, but there are two things that the Statue of Liberty and serialization have in common. So the Statue of Liberty um, was gifted by the people of France to the people of the US at the end of the 19th century, and the parts were constructed in France. Interestingly, the statue was actually fully put together and erected in Paris. It was fully intact there for quite a while before it was disassembled again, crated, and then shipped over to the US. So for example, here you can see a photo of the face that had just arrived on Liberty Island. And um, once all the pieces were on Liberty Island, the statue was reassembled, and that is very much analog serialization. The second similarity is the statue was also the object of some magical activity. Um, in 1983, David Copperfield made it disappear on live television. And so that was very dramatic. Uh, there was audience on the ground and on TV, and they were all kind of taken aback when the curtain fell and the statue was actually gone. Um, this is not serialization per se, but I still think that the surprise and the awe of the audience when the statue has disappeared is something that developers that work with Java serialization can relate to. Because here as well, object state can change in unexpected ways and it's um, possible to create impossible objects. So back to the example to show you this in detail. So here, our statue object, let's say we want to serialize it and write the serialized form to a file, in this case, serial data. The default way to do this with Java serialization is object output streams write object. The framework handles the rest for you. However, this is already the first example of an extra linguistic mechanism because behind the curtain, the framework scrapes the state of the private fields. You remember name, height, and location were all private. And then it writes it to the serialized form. So we are, the, um, the framework uses reflection in this case, set accessible true in particular. So we can see how the access control that we carefully put in place is circumvented here with a backdoor technique. Okay, but um, we can accept this for um, the time being. We have our serialized form here at hand now. It's a simplified version just for the purpose of this demonstration. The main bits here are that we have this container object, TC object, and that contains the type of the, the object and then the data. So in this case, um, the fields, each with name, type, and value. Um, yeah, and that's pretty much it. We extracted the object state and have the serialized form here. That's kind of straightforward. The more interesting part is deserialization. So now we want to deserialize an object with equal state from that serialized form. Default way is to call object input stream read object. Again, the framework handles the rest for you. And what happens now is that the object creation occurs top down. So if we have an object graph, each object is created and then they're linked up. So you can see here with the little check marks that we read through the stream. And as soon as the type is known, an object is created. Now, what's important here now is that it's not the constructor of the statue class that is called and that had invariance checking. No, it's the non-argument constructor of the first non-serializable superclass, or the null arc, null arc constructor of the first non-serializable superclass. In this case, that's object. So object uh, constructor is called, and the um, fields are set to their default values. So in this case, null, zero, and null. So as you can see, there is a window of time where the statue object is in an erroneous state. But we continue reading from the stream and we populate the values. 
So we can see we insert the integer. Now with the location object, the same thing happens. The object constructor is called, the default values are inserted. And then while calling or while reading the values from the stream, we populate them as the values of the object. Only in the, in the very last instance, only when the stream is fully read, the objects are actually linked up. And this is what you can see here. So now location, the, the field points to the location object, the object graph is complete, read object returns, and we have reconstituted the statue object. So far, so good. However, what you might uh, think is that we really rely on the serial stream here to hold the right data. What if that's not the case? So what if we get a malicious stream with data that um, violates the class invariance? In this case, we have a height of minus one and a name of no statue. That shouldn't really be possible. Um, and just to comment here, this stream would have not been generated in our JVM because we don't have a constructor to do that, but it could come from another JVM or simply some untrusted source. So now if we deserialize this, we read the values from the stream again. And I just speed things up here a little bit. You can see uh, we fully read, uh, read object returns and the statue object that we have created is actually impossible, it has a height of minus one and a location of null. So the, the class constructor of, um, oh, sorry, the constructor of the statue class has the invariance checks. It is never called. And it's completely fine here. We successfully um, create an impossible object. I think David Copperfield would be at all. So to recap the problems, uh, during serializing, the Java serialization framework is able to extract state of private fields. So it actively circumvents access control via reflection. During deserializing, the class constructor is never called. Instead, the superclass constructor is called, and any invariance checks that you put in place are never applied. And I think those two aspects are really what I mean when I say that Java serialization was not designed as part of the object model. OK, so we know what's wrong. Now let's move on to section two to see how records fit in the picture here. And for this, I hand over to Chris, who will give you an, a demonstration in the IDE. Thanks, Julia. So what is a record class? A record class is a plain aggregate of data. There's less ceremony in the declaration of a record class than that of a normal class. And we like to say that records are all about the data, the whole data, and nothing but the data. A record is a nominal tuple, and it's a transparent carrier of data. And there's a new kind of syntax in the Java language to support uh, record classes. A record class tightly couples its API with its internal representation. And finally, the declaration of a record class is significantly more concise than that of a normal class. So what does all this mean? Let's take a look at an example. So Julia has already showed us the location class that we've seen earlier. And a location class is morally an aggregate of two things, a city and a country. Um, here we can see that um, to fill out this class, we really need to implement accessor methods to give access to the private final state. We probably need an implementation of hash code and equals if location is ever to be used in a hash set or as a key in a hash map. And for a reasonable debugging experience, we need to have a two string implementation as well. So I'm just gonna go ahead and cut and paste um, some implementations that I've written earlier. And these do the obvious things. So for example, the city method returns the value of city, similarly with country. And look, two locations are considered equal if their cities are equal and their country is equal. The hash code is derived from the city and country and the city and country are printed out in string representation. Now this is not very exciting code. It's quite tedious to write. It's easy to make mistakes and it's error prone. The IDE can help you to write this code, but it can't help you to maintain this code, especially if the location class ever evolves in the future. Really what we want is, we don't necessarily want to be writing this code in the first place because our location is really about two things, the city and country. 
So it looks like the location class um, can be rewritten as a record class. So let's just go ahead and do that now. So there's a new keyword record uh, that you use to declare a record class. Immediately following the record keyword is the name of the record class itself. And in our case, that's location. And then following that, we have the record header. And the record header is where we declare the record components. We have two record components in our location class, the city and country. And that's it. That, that's all you need to do to declare a location record class that's equivalent to the code we've just seen on the screen. So we'll go ahead and just run that program. The simple program uh, creates a location in New York, in the US, and then just prints out the string representation. So there we can see it. Okay, so when I said that a record class was a plain aggregate of data, we've seen that our location class just aggregates a city and a country. There's less ceremony in the declaration of the location class than that of the normal class equivalent. And the declaration has the components, the, the values, the state of the, the record class upfront with the, in the declaration right beside the name of the record class itself. A record class is a nominal tuple, so it has a name. And equally, its components have names themselves. And these names are significant and important. So we've seen that it's a uh, new kind of class. So we use the record keyword to, to declare it. And the declaration was far more concise. It fitted in a single line than that of the normal class equivalent. Now there's some stuff going on here behind the scenes. So the Java compiler is generating um, a number of standard members for us. So the compiler generates us a public accessor method for each of the record components. The compiler also generates a canonical constructor. And that's a constructor that has the same formal parameter list as that of the record header. And then the compiler generates um, hash code equals and two string implementations for us as well. Record classes are always final and record classes always extend from the superclass javalang record. So let's go ahead and take a look at that now. So here I'm using the Java P decompiler from Java 16 and we're going to decompile the location class file. Oops, so we can see the location class here is final, even though we didn't explicitly declare it final, all record classes are final. Location extends from Java Lang record. And the compiler has generated two private final fields for one for each of the components, one for city and one for country. And the compiler has also generated accessor methods, public accessor methods to return the value of the city and the component, or sorry, the city and the country. The compiler has also generated the two string hash code and equals implementations. And these do the obvious thing based on the values of the city and the country. And lastly, the compiler has generated a canonical constructor. This constructor takes two arguments. The first is the city and the second string argument is the country. Okay, so we've seen public accessor methods. We've seen a canonical constructor, hash code equals and two string, record classes are final and extend from Java Lang record. So just returning to what we mean by a record uh, class is transparent. So what we mean by that is that a record um, class makes all of its state available. So you cannot have fields of record class that are internal to the record and not exposed all of the fields of a record class must be declared in the record header. They must be the record components themselves. And we say that the record class tightly couples its API and internal representation. So we have a canonical constructor for constructing a record and that canonical constructor will initialize the component values, city and country in our case. And then the city and country components are available through accessor methods. Okay, so what if you don't like what the compiler generates for you? Well, you can provide an explicit accessor method 
or you can provide a canonical constructor. We also have what's known as a compact form of the canonical constructor. And then record classes, while they are special type of classes, they're still uh, classes themselves. So they can have additional implementation methods or they can implement interfaces. So we'll go ahead and take a look at some of those now. So let's provide an explicit accessor for this city component. So why would you want to do this? Um, well, you might want to do this, for example, if you wanted to normalize um, the value. So let's return the city. This case is always returned in uppercase. So we'll modify our test program to invoke the city accessor and we'll just run it again. So what we expect to see printed out here is New York in uppercase. Okay, great, we can see that there. Um, it doesn't make sense to have a location that has a null city or a null country. So let's provide an explicit canonical constructor to ensure that the city or the country can be, cannot be null. So I said that the canonical constructor has the same formal parameters as that of the record header. So we'll just go ahead and cut and paste them in there. And the body of the implementation needs to assign the private final fields. So we'll go ahead and do that. Okay, so this is what the compiler would generate for us. But what we want to do is we want to ensure that the city or the country cannot be null. So we'll use the objects require non-null uh, method for this. Okay, so we can see there's still a little bit of boilerplate here. The formal parameters, we can actually align them in the compact form, as well as the assignments. So here now we're left with just the invariant checking, which is the logic that we wanted to add, and the boilerplate has been removed. So let's just see that in action. So here we'll try to create a new location uh, object with a null country. So we expect a null pointer exception to be thrown from the constructor. And we can see that there. Okay, so we've seen an explicit accessor. Additionally, the canonical constructor and the compact form to canonical constructor. Let's go ahead and add a custom implementation method. So here we're going to add a custom implementation method that just returns the value of city in reverse. So we'll use the string builder uh, just because it offers us that uh, functionality uh, very conveniently. And we'll invoke the reverse method return the string value. So let's update our test program. And now we're gonna move locations. Let's move to Paris and France and run the program again. Now we expect uh, Paris to be printed out in reverse. Okay, great, we can see that. So record classes can also implement interfaces. So let's declare an interface here called city with a single abstract method, also called city. And we will have our location record implement that. Not terribly exciting because the signature of the city method matches that exactly of the accessor method. So we don't actually need to provide an explicit implementation. But of course, we could implement something like comparable, in which case we'd have to provide a compare to method. And as we'll see in a moment, record classes can also implement serializable. Okay, great. So we've seen explicit uh, methods as well as interfaces. 
So the design of records centers around modeling data as data. And by giving up some of the flexibility of normal classes, we get these really nice semantics. And the boilerplate just takes care of itself. The API is derived mechanically and completely from the state description. And the API includes protocols for construction through the canonical constructor and member access through the accessors. And you get equality, hash code, and string representation as well. We expect uh, future versions of records to support deconstructor patterns so that they can be used in more powerful pattern matching. And now Ulia will take us through how Java serialization can leverage these strong semantics of record classes. Thanks, Chris. Uh, now on to part three. So how can we leverage records in serialization? So now that we know more about records, let's go back to our example and work with record classes instead. You can see them here. We um, have the same fields. They're called components now, name, hint, uh, height, and location. And we have the same invariance checking. And you can see the nice compact form of the canonical constructor here. Uh, to make a record class serializable, we use the same mechanism, implement serializable. However, under the hood, the framework handles a record quite differently. The reason for this is that uh, the concise design of records really allows to rethink the serialization protocol. So for records, there are two properties. The serialization of a record is based only on its state components. So the serialized form is based on the components and cannot be customized. And then the deserialization of a record uses only the canonical constructor. And the canonical constructor can never be bypassed during object creation. The simplicity of this protocol kind of naturally flows from the semantic constraints of records. And as such, records really have a serialization built into their object model. OK, so we instantiate a record object now, statue. You can see it here. And it's uh, very much the same as before. Uh, we still use the same default way of doing that, uh, to, to, of serializing it, object, output stream, write object. Um, now what happens is that the uh, framework can use the accessors provided by the record class. There's no need for backdoor techniques here. And with this, we get the serialized form. And as you might notice, it's the same as that of the ordinary object. This really allows for easy migration from normal classes to record classes. OK, let's look at deserialization. For deserialization, records have some steps that differ from normal classes. The main difference is that for normal classes, we build the object graph from top down. For records, that's from bottom up. So first, what we do is we read the values from the stream and hold them in memory. So either reconstruct objects or hold primitives in memory. We then match those values against the uh, parameters of the record components. And that matching happens by name and value. Any values that we get from the stream that don't match a record component are dropped. And then once we have all these values at hand, we can call the canonical constructor and thus create the record object. OK, so let's see what this looks like with our example. Uh, we deserialize from the serialized form here. We uh, start reading from the stream. And the most important bit now is that the statue object is not created first, as we've seen before with the normal class. Instead, the values are read from the stream. And as I mentioned, they are hold, held in memory. Once we get to this nested location object, the same thing happens again. We read the values from the stream. And now with the string New York and US in memory, we have all the values we need to call the location canonical constructor. So we do that and have a location object at hand now. And with this, we now have all the values we need for the statue constructor. So we call this, and we have created the statue object. As you can see, at no time, there's an invalid object available. This is definitely more secure than for normal classes. However, just like before, what happens if we work with a malicious stream again? So you might remember we have the invariance checks in the constructor, so it shouldn't be possible to create an object, for example, with a height of minus 1, as we had here before, or a location of null. 
we shouldn't be able to create a record with uh, a statue record with this state. Okay, so deserialization happens, we read the values, we have them in uh, memory. And as you might expect, as soon as we call the statue constructor, a no pointer exception is thrown because we have this null check for the location field. So we can see it's not possible to create a record with this erroneous state. Great. So to finish, let's sum up how records make serialization better. Firstly, the design of records really naturally fits in the demands of serialization. They are data-oriented classes and as such, very suitable for serialization. They also have restricted accessibility and final state that makes them much easier to handle during the serialization process. So overall, the semantic constraints of records really allow a tightening of the serialization protocol. The serialized form is known and can be trusted. It's always the records state. No customization is possible. This is easy to understand and also easy to maintain. Then we can always use the accessors to retrieve record state. We don't need to use backdoor techniques like reflection. Again, this is more secure. And then lastly, object creation only happens through the canonical constructor. No more off the radar object creation here. So with this in mind, we hope that you are just as excited about records as we are and go and try them out. Thank you. We have a few links in the presentation and I guess we would move to the Q&A now. Okay, I think we have a question here. Uh, can record classes have serialization magic methods, for example, read object? Um, yeah, we only touched on that briefly during the presentation. So uh, yes, you can implement magic methods or like serial persistent fields is a field um, that is like a magic field. You can implement those, but they are simply ignored for records. And the reason for that is that we don't want to allow any customization of the serialized form. There are two exceptions, and that's um, for the case that you want to nominate a serial proxy. So write, replace, and read, resolve. Those two methods can still be uh, implemented to substitute an object during serialization. OK, we have another question in the chat. Can records have cyclic references? OK, good question, and one we didn't um, discuss. Uh, earlier. So generally no, um, well, definitely no in serialization, but generally no, uh, records themselves can have cyclic uh, references um, because while a record's state is final and immutable, the state itself could be mut mutated. So you could have an array or something that allows the cycle to be created. Um, this generally not a good thing. Um, for serialization, we handle this gracefully by inserting a null value into where the cycle would have been. And the reason this happens is, of course, because deserialization proceeds through the canonical constructor, and we need to deserialize the component values first before they can get passed to the constructor. So cycle is not preserved, although it, it, um, it is handled gracefully by inserting a null where the cycle would have been. Um, another one, can a component be declared as transient in the header? Yes, yeah, so transient is one of those um, uh, keywords that are relevant for serialization. With this, you let's say you had a field, you mark it as transient, it would then be ignored uh, in the default serialization process by Java serialization. Um, so for records, no, you cannot. Um, that is not just the case for transient, but also for keyword like volatile or public, which you probably wouldn't want to do anyways. So no, you cannot set a record component as transient. And another question in the chat. Are there any frameworks that already work with records? So there are. We know of a few, at least. Um, so Jackson, which is a popular library uh, for serializing to, to JSON, and it's used in Hibernate and Spring. Uh, since version 2.12, uh, records are support, supported. 
and we are actively contributing to Xtreme and Cryo as well. Um, there's pull requests in progress there. One more question. Uh, do records have their own format in the object serialization stream protocol? Yes, yeah. So I think we touched on that a little bit in the presentation. No, they don't. They have the same uh, format. So I think you maybe you remember this TC object container, which holds the object data. That's the same for an ordinary class object or a record class object. And um, yeah, that really helps migrating from normal classes to record classes because you can just swap them out 